So here I am in the main operations room at Western Approaches Command. Western Approaches Command is situated beneath a massive Art Deco building, uh, the Exchange Building, in Liverpool. And it was here that the RAF and the Navy commanded jointly the escorts for the incredibly important transatlantic convoys. Now, way to the west, there was, of course, Canada and America, but a lot of uh, trade also came from places like South Africa, uh, around the Cape of Good Hope, from India, possibly. And so anything coming from the west into Britain had to be protected by the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. So, on my left here, we have a huge wall covered in a massive map showing the Atlantic. Far to the right, you can see good old Blighty there. And you can see arrows and little aircraft symbol and so forth, representing uh, convoys and flights of aircraft, making their way back and forth across the Atlantic to, and you can see here, this is Canada. You've got to be Greenland there, Iceland also on the map. Uh, the routes here are being traced with wool, colored wool. This is just some sort of pinky, purpley wool here. And uh, this is how it was done in the cabinet war rooms in London, which I visited, and it's a very sort of cheap and effective way of doing it. Uh, and what they've done here is they've stuck pins into the wall uh, that they put the wire, uh, put the wool around. Now, in the cabinet war rooms, uh, they've got maps on the wall, uh, but here we don't know exactly what the wall was like because this is not the original wall. This is a piece of hardboard that was put there in the 1990s to show roughly what would have been here. And um, one of the uh, things that uh, this video is for is in appeal. If there's, if there's anyone out there who knows, um, uh, perhaps they, they, they worked here or they knew someone who worked here or they have some uh, connection with this place and they have a detail such as what this map was made out of, could you stick pins in it, uh, that would be very useful. So somehow, and we think pins and wool, the path of the various convoys and aircraft patrols were traced onto this enormous map so that the people sitting at desks here, looking at it, uh, could act on absolutely up-to-date information. And the people in this room over here, which was occupied by RAF staff, with the RAF commander in his office in uh, that room there, and the Navy staff in this room with their commander, Admiral Maximilian Horton, whose office was up there, who was in command of the entire station, they could, at a glance, look across and, all going well, see an up-to-date picture of the situation. This was so vital, it's difficult, it, it's almost impossible to exaggerate how vital it was. Winston Churchill said that the Battle of the Atlantic, the U-boat menace, was the single thing, possibly even the only thing, that really scared him. He was fairly sure that the British could, could win in North Africa, could, that D-Day would work and so forth, but he was really scared. And there was a time in the war when the German U-boats were sinking so much Allied, footage, uh, allied uh, tonnage of ships that it seemed that we could actually lose it. We could actually be starved into submission. And some answer to the U-boat menace had to be uh, arrived at. And technology moved on. Um, for instance, the ley light was invented, which was a, a system of lights that would be attached onto aircraft, which would uh, give an accurate uh, triangulation to a U-boat that it might spot. And there were all sorts of detectors um, that uh, were attached to destroyers so they could, they could detect through sonar and so forth what was under the water and there were more efficient um, bombs and depth charges and things called hedgehogs and so forth for, for dropping death down below to deal with the U-boats. Uh, the um, but for a long time, we, the British, were losing this war and you could say that the, the war was turned around in this room because the people in these rooms based on what was on this wall, were making the most vital decisions, which meant that it was possible to keep Britain in the war, keep her supplied with all the, the food and munitions and fuel and so forth, absolutely vital to the war effort. And if D-Day was ever going to happen, if the, the Western Allies were ever going to relieve Europe, you can't launch D-Day, you can't launch uh, assault craft uh, from there all the way across the, the Atlantic. It can only be done by the short route, a hop into France from Britain. So this sea route across the Atlantic had to be secure. And it was here that the decisions were made to secure it. And interestingly, this is an example of the utility of wargaming, because this looks a bit like a wargaming map, doesn't it? These look a bit like wargaming pieces. Well, 
There were permanent staff here, most of them wrens and wafts, that is, women of the uh, the auxiliary uh, air force and uh, the the women of the uh, R E. W-R-E-N, the Women's Royal Enlisted Navy, I think it stands for, and the Wrens and WAFs were most of the 300 staff here. And a lot of the men coming here weren't here very long. They came in, they did their bit, they got a bit of training perhaps, and they moved on. But a lot of the, 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 the women were permanent staff here, and uh, they would war game. They would try out different ways of finding a U-boat in this, in this mess. And one story that I heard recently, I can't say for certain that it's true, but it makes an interesting story, is that one of the commanders naval commanders was a, rather skeptical and he said all right then to a 17 year old uh, wren go on then. i'll be the u-boat commander you see if you can find me and after she beat him resoundingly three times on the trot he thought hmm, okay maybe we should revise our tactics in how we look for u-boats so wargaming has some utility now uh, up these perilous ladders uh, people would have to climb uh, to update the map and one tragedy stu uh, struck um, when uh, a wren or, or a waf, I'm not sure which, fell from a ladder and died. That happened in 1943, and there's actually a little plaque in this room commemorating that. Uh, over here, we have boards that needed to be kept up to date by people running up this sort of ladder, and they would write on in chalk all the various changes that needed and move these symbols around. I'm not quite sure what all these mean. Uh, but at a glance, people who were in the know and knew what these symbols meant could see what state all these various uh, aircraft were in. Were they refueling? Were they returning? Uh, and so forth. Uh, the weather is also recorded on a, on a board in this room. And in a 1990s reconstruction of the room, uh, there were loads of um, mannequins in, in uh, tight-fitting extremely sexy uh, uniforms uh, with croupier sticks like this on an enormous table that was where you see this scar on the floor. And so they were, they were positioned doing the thing that you see in the movies, you know, with the croupier sticks. But um, alas, that was uh, stuff of fiction. And we know from photographic evidence that in fact, it was movable desks that were here with, with telephones and so forth and people regarding what was going on and they're able to move around. So uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, the popular image of that massive wargaming table with the croupier sticks, which is very appealing. And one day, one day, I want to be rich enough so that I can have a wargaming table and lots of women in tight-fitting RAF uniforms with croupier sticks. I want that for me. But for a museum, they want something a bit more realistic. So they're going to be um, repairing this floor and uh, putting in lots of desks, which are more authentic. This is Charlie 3 Echo. Where are you receiving? Receiving loud and clear, Charlie 3 Echo. Please proceed. Now, as I'm talking to you, this museum is closed, but there are workers hard at work uh, bringing it up to scratch. It opened to the public in the 1990s. Uh, this was actually classified. You wouldn't even be allowed to know this existed until the 1960s. It was top secret. Uh, but then in the 1990s, um, a museum was opened here, but unfortunately it fell somewhat into neglect and it needs bringing up to, to, to date and up to scratch. And you can see a man here hard at work uh, simulating the back end of a lorry. Why would he do that? Well, because uh, this is a street scene and one of the things that's going to be in it is uh, the black market operating out of the back of a lorry. Not strictly legal, but I can get your nylons. Uh, so, uh, this is going to be a street uh, as it would have been in the 1940s during the war. You can see that they've got tape on the windows. Uh, that's not actually to stop the window breaking, of course. A bomb blast would still shatter the window. But all going well, that tape will stop the shards flying around so much because it was broken glass flying that caused a very high proportion of casualties during air raids. It's wonderful that the public gets to see this because it is such an important place. Uh, when the uh, people running the war realised that it was just too dangerous to have the main naval base in Britain very close to, to France because the French ports had all been taken over by the Germans and of course they were within easy range of the Luftwaffe. Uh, they moved things here. This is where it happened. So perhaps this is what people should be allowed to see. The reception really is quite extraordinary. It's, it's though you were in the room with me. Uh, the thing is that this is probably not actually where there was a hotline to Churchill. Uh, in the 1990s, when this uh, museum was refurbished and, and kitted out with lots of, you might call it set dressing to appeal to the public, uh, they said that this was the telephone booth with the hotline to Churchill. But in fact, we have no reason to believe that that was the case. Uh, where I'm standing was actually the office of the flag lieutenant, uh, who was running things on behalf of her master, who was office was through there, uh, Admiral Maximilian Horton. And, well, her name, that's right, it was a woman, was Catherine. 
and uh, by many accounts she was uh, quite a formidable woman which is easy to imagine as she would have had a lot of very young women under her charge. This was her bedroom. Uh, I don't have any reason to believe that uh, much that you can see in the bedroom is actually original but there would have been presumably a bed of some sort here. Um, a lot of the women were very young. In fact, a stipulation was that they were meant to be under 21 and very good at maths because they were supposed to be able to do lots of sums which are necessary for all the coordinates and frequencies and headings and vectors and so forth that they had to keep track of with all the convoys and flights of aircraft. So uh, a, an ability at maths was useful. I'm not entirely sure why they had to be quite so young. It's a little bit suspicious and uh, perhaps this added to the burden of uh, the, uh, the flag lieutenant's job because she had a lot of young women uh, under her charge and who knows what would happen when a dashing young um, RAF pilot perhaps came to visit. Um, she slept here and she would have eaten here and she would have spent a very long time here. So long in fact that they installed sunray lamps down here uh, to give some sort of simulation of sunlight uh, to give people um, to get rid of perhaps that, that pale pallor that people take on when they've been away from the sun for too long. And behind these reinforced walls, so much of the air they breathed had travelled far through ducts, ducts, ducts. I'm sitting in a very significant spot. We have a photograph of Admiral Maximilian Horton sitting right here. I would like to be able to say to you, sitting at this very desk, although I'm not sure that this is the actual desk in the photograph. Um, the uh, curators of the museum in the 1990s have used a staple gun and have stapled a number of things to it. Um, and I'd like to think that if they thought that this was the actual desk that they wouldn't have done that. Um, is this stretch limo telephone here the one in the photo? No, it's, it's similar but I don't think it's the actual one. And you see this uh, row of eight switches here and they're so Oh, they're so satisfying. You know, old-fashioned switches, they just feel so good. Why do we not make switches like this anymore? But anyway, there are eight across there, and in the photograph there are ten. So these are not the originals. I I'm not here desecrating history by switching this switch, um, but I am in the place where the man who had to make perhaps the most important decisions of the war sat. Um, this was the hot seat. He could look out there and see where all the convoys making their way to and from Britain were and he could see where the escort vessels were and where the flights of squadrons of aircraft were making their way patrolling looking for U-boats trying to destroy U-boats if they found them and he had telephone communications. He also had uh, a shouting tube here. In the photograph you can see that there's the, a, a flexible extension uh, which he could reach uh, from his uh, chair so that he could talk to the people immediately down below. Do you have the latest report? Over. Yes, I will sitting down to you shortly. Jolly good. He would spend many days on the trot here. He had to be on duty at times of crisis, ready to make a decision at any moment be, and be ready to be woken up perhaps in the middle of the night with some terrible or great news. Though for the early part of the war it was largely terrible news because uh, British shipping was going down hundreds of thousands of tons of it every week. They were certainly dark times. I was able to wander around the dark bowels of the complex with my guides by torchlight. Lovely Bakelite telephones, sleeping quarters, offices, storerooms, some mystery rooms. More Bakelite telephones. I want one. This was a naval fire extinguisher for use on naval fires. While I was there they were still finding things that had been squirrelled away such as this case of documents, a secret message signed by the station commander, this big pile of plans that had once been destined for the fire, period newspapers. They found the original blueprints for the centre. Oh nice scale! but. Such was the secret nature of the place that it is labelled as a restaurant. An actual blueprint that's actually blue! There were disappointments, such as when they opened this room to find... Oh. Keys to... Um, the backup power generator was, ironically enough, powered by a World War I German U-boat engine. Throw the switching door! Bang! Nice big dials and that's a proper fuse. 
British made, 200 to 300 amps. And as for proper switches... So we have here an ensign with a bit of what might be battle damage. Now, all the honour, the honour. I'm going to take this upstairs actually before it gets. Uh, I'm not precious like the Americans. <laughs> she wants me in the Navy. All right, I'll join. The old film projector. Inside, you can see the carbon rods that would be burned away by the electricity and would need constant adjustment as they shortened. They use this same method for generating the intense beams used in anti-aircraft searchlights. The plan is to show the station as it was during World War II, which will mean removing some of the machinery which belongs more to the Cold War era and has a different period style to it. A plot of a search pattern there. This bomb buried itself 22 feet down in the ground and then forgot to go bang, which was nice. The command centre survived the war unscathed. The same could not be said of the building just across the road from it, which the Luftwaffe converted into a modern car park. But you can still see where the once substantial construction stood. Though I don't think that anything in front of me is actually original, except Possibly this lamp, which is in the photograph, and it has a very unusual gold mottled pattern on it, which would be quite difficult to, uh, to reproduce. And um, this lamp might actually be the lamp that, that shone light onto the man who had to make some of the biggest decisions, frankly, in history. Because if the British had lost the War of the Atlantic, if we had been cut off and starved into submission, the Americans could never have launched uh, the D-Day from America. And if the uh, Americans and the British had not jointly been shipping vast amounts of supplies to the Russians uh, over the top of Norway to Murmansk, how well would the Russians have done? Let's not forget that the Russians very, very nearly threw in the towel. Um, there was a moment when Stalin was actually walking in Moscow to a train that was, that had, that was steamed up, that they'd brought it up to pressure, it was ready to go. And he, on the way to the train, thinking that he was going to abandon Moscow, he changed his mind and turned around and decided, no, okay, we're going to, we're going to carry on and we're going to defend Moscow. And that is, a, that is a decision that could have gone very wrong. And perhaps if he didn't have all the resources of the West uh, distracting the Germans from the Eastern Front and supplying the Eastern Front, uh, then possibly the Russians would not have won the Second World War. So it could be that the decisions made exactly where I'm sitting now were the most important decisions ever made. The museum is now open, six days a week. Good night.